Thank you, Ines. I hope you can hear me. I think you do. Um, well, it is still a it is still a good morning or already a good afternoon, depending on the time zone uh, in Europe. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, I uh, I have uh, long reflected on the very um, interesting subject of today's conference. Um, as, as a judge, you know, we're writers of the law, and you are readers, and I thought that sometimes readers know the law better than the writers. And uh, instead of giving you the, the very detailed uh, analysis of the case law, which I'm sure you know better than, than myself and can quote many of the interesting judgments, uh, I have chosen maybe the path of a more philosophical uh, intervention to give some reflections, more general reflections on the subject, um, which perhaps also would allow me better to maintain the, the independence as the judge, because you know that uh, fundamental rights, as important as they are, sometimes uh, are the subject of controversy because they're so sensitive issues and dear to both member states and the European Union. Um, so. I will give you the hints and the reflections. Uh, I will give you also some reference to the case law, but uh, I'm quite sure that uh, you will be able also to find the answers yourselves, or maybe you know them already, or maybe you would disagree with me. It's up to you to decide. I certainly thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It's not so very often the judges can speak freely. I can't guarantee that we will be speaking. I understand that we're not speaking here on the Chatham House rule, but uh, still I think we would be prudent with the information that we use. So, fundamental rights um, were recognized as part of the European community's uh, fundamental values confirmed upon individuals and invocable before the Court of Justice. In the Court's landmark judgment, <coughs> Van Gendel laws back in February 1963. This judgment was delivered just a bit less than a decade after the entry into force of the European Convention on Human Rights and less than four years of, uh, after the creation of the European Court of Human Rights. The first judgment of the European Court of Human Rights itself was delivered only on the 14th of November 1960. So you see the little time span between the first judgment of the European Court of Human Rights and the moment when uh, the fundamental rights become a core issue in the European Union itself. However, it took the European community and later the European Union almost another half century to establish its own list of fundamental rights. EU Fundamental Rights Charter was adopted in 2000, but became binding only with the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty on the 1st of December 2009. Until then, existence and interpretation of fundamental rights in question would have uh, or had to be verified on an ad hoc basis. We all know that during all this time, the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court uh, of Human Rights case law have been the central inspiration point for the EU and its Court of Justice, gradually evolving to become a clearly defined political will to achieve EU's accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. Nonetheless, the principles established by the EU Fundamental Rights Charter have proven to be somewhat difficult to apply because since the entry into force of the Fundamental Rights Charter, we have been back and forth between the Member States and the European Court of Justice in battling for the monopoly, if I may say, um, or some would say, of the interpretation of what the rights mean. I will give you some of the, some of the elements. Um, first, Article 6 of the Treaty of the European Union and Article 52 of the Fundamental Rights Charter mention the European Convention on Human Rights as the main interpretation tool for the Charter. However, the list of rights established by the Charter is not identical to the list established by the European Convention. To name but few, I could mention the right to collective bargaining, environmental protection, rights of a child, but these are just few examples. The European Convention uh, on Human Rights also has only a limited role in implying and interpreting these principles. 
I haven't yet found the judgment of the Court of Justice where it would have a detailed analysis of the various aspects, for example, of the best interest of the child, including existing national practices or other provisions of the UN Convention on the Right of the Child. You would find this convention mentioned in numerous judgments, but it would always, at least judgments that I have read, be limited to a rather brief uh, reference that there is this principle of the best interest of the child, but no evolving interpretation of that principle so far uh, have been given. Perhaps you have found the judgment. It would be very interesting to hear your views on this. Also, I have found only 12 instances where the Court of Justice would use the reference to the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and only nine instances where the issue of racial discrimination was examined. These are core human rights principles, so how can we explain the limited case law on the subject? Well, one of the reasons could be, of course, that uh, the interpretation uh, of uh, treaty provisions are dependent on the preliminary reference proceedings. So it is for the national courts to address the issue and to describe the relevant applicable provision in, uh, in, in a detailed manner. So here, the, the Court of Justice has very limited discretion, I would say, but still, it's interesting as a fact. Second, for some rights that are covered by both the Charter and the European Convention on Human Rights, the interpretation by the two courts, and I mean the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice, may be different. My very dear example that I have already mentioned on a number of occasions is the uh, civil aspects of child abduction. While the European Court of Human Rights generally treats this issue under Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights as part of right to private and family life, the European Court of Justice addresses this issue as a departing point, as a freedom of movement. If we look at the interplay between those two principles, the checks and balances that are applicable to each of those two rights are not entirely the same. What is justifiable under the freedom of movement may not be justifiable under right, the right to private and family life. So there is um, an issue to reflect upon. Third, up until now, there has been no clear position as to what role constitutional traditions common to the member states should play in interpreting EU fundamental rights. I would like to recall that the principles of respect of the national identities of member states is enshrined in Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. Article 6.3 of the same treaty uh, in its turn recognizes constitutional traditions common to the member states as general principles of the European Union law. Article 52, Paragraph 4 of uh, the Fundamental Rights Charter and 6 um, give further clarification, and I quote, insofar as this charter recognizes fundamental rights as they result from the constitutional traditions common to the member states, those rights shall be interpreted in harmony with those traditions. Full account shall be taken of national laws and practices, practices as specified in this charter. Taken together with the fact that constitutional traditions of member states may be common, but are not necessarily identical, the question arises as to how much room for diversity in fundamental rights protection does EU law leaves to states. By way of comparison, while the European Convention of Human Rights has been ratified by all EU member states, so the rights contained therein should be seen as common traditions. The scope of obligations between member states may slightly differ with respect to contracting states who have expressed reservations or declarations. <coughs> I personally have a feeling that the full potential of this issue is yet to be discovered. Examples so far demonstrate that constitutional traditions have so far have had a rather limited role to play in establishing and interpreting the common fundamental values. <clears throat>
But there are some positive examples, or, well, I would say 12-folded examples. And I would like to mention one of the most recent ones, and maybe one of the most recently very much discussed ones. This is the case C673 of 2016, the case of Common. In this case, as you may very well know, uh, the Court of Justice has recognized the right to enter and reside in uh, a, European, um, in a European Union member state, uh, the same couple, uh, the same sex couple that have married in another European member state. Of course, uh, there is a great diversity, I would say, the, the, even the European Union member states go to the extremes in their position with regard to the same-sex marriage. So the court did have, to, well, at least was confronted with the issue of which opinion should be given or which approach should be given a priority over another. And the approach taken by the court is very interesting, but it is not... I would say, a 100% clear-cut conclusion. Well, first of all, the court was confronted by a situation that the, a, a, a European Union national was uh, married to a non-national of the European Union in the European Union member state that was not the member state of the nationality. So he was traveling with the, his partner back from his member state of the residence to the member state of his nationality. While the member state of residence did recognize the same-sex marriage, the member state of nationality did not. So the court was confronted with the issue which of the two interpretations should be given the priority, the one of the, resi of the residence member state or the one of the nationality member state. And the European uh, Court of Justice has given uh, a very interesting um, interpretation of uh, a very important interpretation of the subject. The Court of Justice derived from the principle of the European Union nationality, which gives the nationals the right to enjoy the protection of the treaties. And I would dare maybe to quote some paragraphs of this judgment to uh, highlight the conclusion uh, given. So the court has uh, recalled that as a Romanian national, Mr. Common enjoyed the status of the European Union citizen under Article 20 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. In that regard, the court uh, recalled that on numerous occasions, uh, the, that the Union uh, citizenship is intended to be, the uh, to be the fundamental status of nationals of the member states. A national of a member state, which has exercised in his capacity as a union citizen, his freedom to move and reside within a member state other than his member state of origin, may rely on the rights pertaining to the union citizenship. So then the court has had to compare that some of the member states do recognize the same size couple and some states do not. While the court recalled that the relevant directive refers to a spouse, that reference is gender neutral. And that was a very important element in this discussion. The court then proceeded uh, to say that given the fact that the marriage of the same-sex couple has been concluded in one member state, Another member state, regardless of the fact whether under its national law it does or does not recognize marriages concluded on its own territory as legal marriages, cannot prevent couples entering from another member state with a legally concluded marriage to enter their territory. And that is very interesting because the, the court has given uh, an interpretation to the mutual trust principle because this this conclusion comes, derives from the mutual trust that we do have to rely on the decisions given by other member states to say that even if that member state does not recognize same-sex marriage, it does have to recognize the decision rendered by another EU member state as being valid on its territory. This logics 
has a very positive side, in my view, because by this, the European Court of Justice has given what we say, or has arrived as what we say, the progressive interpretation of fundamental rights. And as we know, for those who have their background in fundamental rights, that the principle of progressive interpretation is one of the core principles underlying the, the whole fundamental rights science. However, this judgment has not answered another question. Quid the national constitutional traditions of member states? This judgment did not address this fact in a very direct way. In an indirect manner, uh, we conclude from that judgment that the court has chosen the path of the most favorable interpretation of fundamental rights. But I wonder if this is always the principle to be applied. Do we always, or does the court always have to choose the principle of the most favorable interpretation of a given human rights, uh, or the court may choose in favor of concluding that the common or the, the, the absence of the common constitutional values should prevail. I will give maybe another not so very favorable uh, example of no, not so very favorable area of fundamental rights law um, that uh, you will find uh, a lot of discussion, and especially in the light of the most recent jurisprudence, uh, this is right to access of documents. Because if we look at the evolving uh, common constitutional tradition of a large number of member states, one of which is my own member state, Latvia, where we have exclusive uh, or rather far-going transparency rules when it comes to access to documents, uh, the jurisprudence or the case law of the European Court of Justice and the General Court uh, of the European Union is rather conservative. It goes very often in favor of not revealing the documents. Um, and maybe you have heard of one of the recent judgments, which I think is still under appeal. That was the request by journalists to have access to the documents by the European Parliament on uh, the uh, use of European Parliament funds, where uh, the, the general court uh, on, in its judgment concluded that uh, the, um, the burden, the administrative burden for the European Parliament would be too heavy to reveal this document. So it was concluded against uh, the um, um, the revealing of those documents. But I think, uh, I have checked, maybe I have not checked right, but I think this judgment is still under appeal before the Court of Justice. Yeah, I see the confirmation, it's still under the appeal. Well, what other examples uh, I may give? I would have chosen to give the example of abortions, but that might be a bit too controversial. So I will choose another example, which is sexual harassment. True. I think you would agree with me that there is a great divergence between member states as to the effectiveness of protection granted to the potential victims of sexual harassment. But also if we look at the case law of member states, there are some very good examples that may give us um, um, a reason or a case of progressive uh, interpretation of those rights. However, if I look at the case law of the Court of Justice, I don't find cases where that principle was given or would have been given a meaningful interpretation. Fourth, as you may have already induced from the previous part, there is a great deal of issues still uncovered uh, by the case law of the Court of Justice by means of preliminary ruling. And I would like to underline by means of preliminary ruling because even if I go back to the sexual harassment cases, there are uh, quite uh, numerous jurisprudence, but it relates to the civil service cases. And there the court limits itself to interpreting of the strict rules of the EU internal law. 
and this is not the same as applying this law against member states, meaning how, whether this principle should be given a horizontal effect across the European Union or not. As of today, for example, I have found only two preliminary references cases where the issue of sexual harassment has been raised. This is the case C-652 of 2016 and C-345 of 2017. But the issue has not been addressed in the text of the judgment. True, for the Court of Justice to address and to interpret uh, a large uh, or one or another fundamental rights issue, a respective request for preliminary ruling must come from a member state. Is it so that no relevant issue have, has ever arisen before the national courts? I doubt it. Or that these issues are not important fundamental human rights? I have some doubts too. It would be very inter interesting to understand better the reasons why some issues do not reach the European Court of Justice. So far, the statistic, well, maybe it is the wrong statistic, but at least the impression uh, that the Court of Justice statistics gives that the most frequently addressed issues of fundamental rights uh, before the Court of Justice relate to the family reunification in various contexts. Um, and non refoulement the issues related to criminal proceedings and recently all the whole package of the criminal justice uh, rights have been addressed, most, most frequently the European arrest warrant, and some limited uh, issues of discrimination. There have been some case law on the, right, uh, on the protection of the right to property, but if we look at the articles of the Fundamental Rights Charter, the case law of uh, the Court of Justice is not evenly distributed. There are some articles for which we do have an evolving interpretation and some articles that, as I have already mentioned, that remain more or less mute without the relevant case law. So these are all very important issues, as I said, the fundamental rights. But unfortunately, the existing statistics gives room for the abusive rhetoric, as we have seen in the media, that the court is not concerned with the average individual, but with, I apologize to say, I am on the verge to become racist and intolerant, that the court is there to protect illegal immigrants and criminals. I know that I sound provocative and controversial but I personally see great need for more and better preliminary questions in the area of fundamental rights. This, is, this remains very much a terra incognita. The fifth element. Most of examples that I mentioned in my intervention descend from the principle of mutual trust and the related right of the freedom of movement as individuals move from one state to another which is one of the core principles of the European Union law. And as we know, the case of Cassis de Dijon is almost as old as Van Genden laws. So those principles have, uh, well, I dare to say, almost equal value. The very principle that has been seen as potentially undermining, um, undermining the effectiveness of protection of human rights by the European Court of Human Rights and I refer to the principle of mutual trust. And I know that for those who come from Latvia, uh, we know one of the most recent fundamental judgments rendered by the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Avantage versus Latvia, where the, the court was rather critical, but still hasn't found a violation of the European Convention. But this is an important element in the discussion. Still, the Court of Justice of the European Union has always strongly defended this principle. The Court's firm stand on this issue, combined with the ultimate wish to protect the principle of autonomy of the European Union law, has become the reason for the, rejecting, for the rejection, in its opinion, 2002 uh, of 2013, of the draft EU accession treaty to the European Convention on Human Rights. Since then, however, the Court of Justice seems to soften a little bit, it's standing on the mutual trust, 
as it has already recognized in a number of cases related to the European arrest warrant, uh, exceptions to this principle. However, it still remains to be seen how these exceptions or whether these exceptions and how far these exceptions already applied in the European arrest warrant cases would be applicable in other areas of uh, EU law. Because, as I mentioned, there are many rights that stem from the freedom of movement and therefore are closely related to the principle of mutual trust. Sixth element. The already mentioned opinion of 2 of 2013 has surprised at least some of us on another point. And that point is related to the interpretation of Article 53 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I quote, the Court of Justice has interpreted that provision as meaning that application of national standards of protection of human rights must not compromise the level of protection provided by the Charter on the primacy, unity, and effectiveness of the European Union law. Insofar as Article 53 of the European Convention on Human Rights essentially reserves the power of the contracting parties to lay down higher standards of protection of fundamental rights than those guaranteed by the Convention, that provision should be coordinated with Article 53 of the Charter, as interpreted by the Court of Justice, so that the power granted to member states by Article 53 of the ECHR is limited with respect to the rights recognized by the Charter that correspond to those guaranteed by the ECHR, to that which is necessary to ensure that the level of protection provided by the Charter and the primacy, unity, and effectiveness of EU law is not compromised. In other words, unless I'm mistaken as to the meaning of this uh, text, the Court has put a cap on the level of protection of fundamental rights. But how to reconcile this conclusion with the already mentioned facts that not all rights have been examined by the Court of Justice? Those examined are not necessarily have been examined from the same angle as the ECHR. Or, as I have already mentioned, the list of rights itself is not identical between the two documents. Hence, again, my remark. Quid, constitutional tradition common to the member states and national laws and practices, as I have already mentioned. Is there no room for a progressive interpretation of the principle of equivalence and effectiveness to give at least some rule for the application of higher national standards of protection of fundamental rights? The situation is a bit like in a school. Does everyone have to meet the average, or some may be allowed to be better than that? If this does not hurt the common objective, let's say the effective, of the, uh, pr uh, principle, the, the effective application of the principle of mutual trust, why not? For example, as I have mentioned, transparency issues. The issue of access to documents is rarely related to the issue of mutual trust. Could this be the reason why certain questions are not addressed to the court? Well, this is for you to find the answer, to reflect and to give your views. Against this very background of rather sophisticated relations between the constitutional traditions of member states and the European Union values, comes the question of the rule of law mechanism. The idea of the mechanism is very interesting and has a great potential, I agree. However, the practical application is far from being clear. Again, I would like to stress some elements that I see in this discussion. First of all, what impact, if any, for us to discuss, the creation and application of this mechanism would leave on the principle of conferral, or rather non-conferral, in the large area of fundamental rights. Values enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union are not linked to the strict application of the European Union law. So how this should play, or whether this fact should play a role. Second, 
On the basis of which criteria should we define the union values enshrined in the very same Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union? As I have mentioned, the traditions, the constitutional traditions, may be common, but they are not identical. One could say that the annual report on fundamental rights in the European Union or the justice scoreboard or the reports by the fundamental rights agency could be used as a source for the discussion. However, for a rather lengthy period of time, there has been a rather fearful debate between member states and the European Commission that those reports are not conclusive enough for the very same reason that the European Union does not have a direct competence in the area of fundamental rights, and therefore the information used, or a great deal of information used in all those reports, come from external sources, meaning it is not being directly collected by the fundamental rights agency or by the Commission. And I have lived in, in my professional life as the legal advisor to uh, the European uh, Union mission uh, in Brussels. <laughs> Numerous discussions between member states and the Commission where member states contested the adequacy and the uh, correctness of the information contained in the report. And if I'm not mistaken, recently France has even uh, formulated a, a formal objection against the text. Um, I have not had the the time to check this information, but um, I'm quite sure that my recollection is correct. So, third element, who should have the right to trigger the mechanism? In the case of Poland, the, con the Commission went full steam against the <coughs> member state. But how does this action comply with the principle of separation of powers? True, in accordance with Article 17 of the Treaty of the European Union, the Commission is the watchdog of the European Union treaties. However, we cannot deny the fact that the Commission is a political body. The Commission is the government of the European Union. So how this fact is reconciled that the political body goes against the sovereign member states. And I recall again what Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the European Union says that the Commission or the European Union has to respect equality before the treaties. Um, equality of member states before the treaty, their national identities, inherent in their fundamental structures, political and constitutional and essential state functions. How is this reconciled? Especially given the fact that the Commission, as a political body, still does not have a written set of rules concerning principle governing their procedures. And I speak of the European administrative law. And we know from the numerous evidences in the case law of the Court of Justice that the margin of discretion enjoyed by the Commission is a very difficult element to interpret. Fourth, what should become the triggering point? I'm not denying the fact that the situation with the reform of the judiciary in Poland requires action. However, from the layman's perspective that I put myself in, I fail to see why or how the Commission chose Poland over other countries, or why the Commission has chosen action under Article 2 and 7, which is the rule of law mechanism, and not the infringement proceedings. For example, the situation with respect to the principle of non refoulement in Greece and Belgium has led to double violation, the one uh, found by the European Court of Human Rights and the one found by the Court of Justice itself. This situation uh, affected a non-derogable fundamental right, 
it was structural and affected large number of people. Still, no rule of law mechanism was initiated. Another example is the situation with the lengthy decisions, judicial decisions in Italy. That has been subject to an incredible number of uh, the violations found by the European Court of Human Rights, resolutions by the Committee of Ministers, and the problem is systemic, structural, which undermines the effective implementation of the principle of mutual trust. Still, no action has been taken by the European Union. In the case of Hungary, where we have a fundamental issue affecting civil society and operation of civil society, also no action has been taken. Against this background, the situation of Poland, and again, I'm on the verge of becoming contro uh, controversial, affects a fundamental principle of the independence of judiciary, and I again underline that it requires action, but so far, the Court of Justice, unless again I'm mistaken, has not examined a concrete. Has it? It's pending. So, has not yet examined a concrete uh, decision that was, that has become a result of that fundamental problem. While in the case again of Italy, Hungary, and uh, Greece and Belgium, there have been concrete uh, results. Fifth, perhaps I'm exaggerating again the importance of the Montesquieu theory of the separation of power, but how could this mechanism, which is so fundamental, operate without the involvement of an independent judicial body, the European Court of Justice, whose core role, in according with Article 19, Paragraph 1 is to ensure that the interpretation and application of the European Union treaties, the law is observed. In my humble view, the Court of Justice could play a crucial role in the process of the choice of mechanism, that is whether the action under so-called rule of law mechanism is required or an ordinary infringement proceeding would suffice. What I'm trying to say that in my view, member state concern would deserve to have the right to appeal against the so-called rule of law inquiry triggering decision. Second, and most importantly, the evaluation of whether the situation is or is not compatible with the common fundamental values of the European Union should be done by an independent judicial body whose members meet the highest standard of impartiality and objectiveness and which procedure respect the standard of fairness. So what conclusion I may try to draw from all these comparisons? It has been great achievement that the European Union over the many years of its existence has evolved from a purely economic community to a union of values, which its own with its own established core values and principle and a list of fundamental rights. However, the union is not a state. It is a union of sovereign nations with their own constitutional traditions from which stem the common union's values. In my humble view, neither autonomy of EU law nor values can exist in abstract from the constitutional traditions of its member states. Therefore, it is indispensable to ensure a close interaction between national courts and, most importantly, national constitutional courts with the Court of Justice. Preliminary reference procedure is a crucial tool in this regard. However, perhaps more discussion is needed as to whether a request for reference from a constitutional court should be treated in the same manner as a request coming from an ordinary court. It is unavoidable, unavoidable that there is always, there will always be a friction as to what substance should be given to one or another principle of EU law. To find an answer to this question, the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union should be respected. In my eyes, the Court still has a great deal to, an, of unused potential, albeit increasingly limited human resources. This is why I would like to recall that the Court of Justice consists of the two institutions, the General Court and the Court of Justice. Perhaps this debate could also help feed into the ongoing discussion on the transfer of competences from the Court of Justice to the General Court to relieve the former from at least some of the time-consuming fact-finding and evidence-checking functions and let it concentrate its attention more on the issues of constitutional importance. To give a full effect to the principle of common European values, one must avoid the situation where member states pick and choose 
which values are important to them and which are less important, as such approach undermines the very nature of the common uh, element. Nonetheless, the existence of the common core, in my view, should not preclude member states from establishing higher standard, at least in some areas, as this would only be consistent with the principle of progressive interpretation of fundamental rights. True, this higher national standard may not produce a negative effect on the principle of mutual trust. Again, here an ever-evolving dialogue between national constitutional courts and the Court of Justice could be of great value. This dialogue could also contribute to the evolution of the principle of autonomy of EU law. Finally, the European Union institutions themselves should avoid the picking and choosing between values and applicable principles. Lack of consistency and transparency over the applicable principles leaves room for extreme rhetoric and political movement. In my view, it is the right time to recall the results of the previous European <coughs> elections which, which took place in 2014. It had the lowest turnout since the elections of 1979, which was the average of 42% a bit more. The lowest national turnout in 2014 was registered in Slovakia, only 13%, one three. The last European elections have also resulted in the considerable increase of the number of extreme populists in the European Parliament, the institution appointing the European Commission. I have myself been a witness how the European Parliament platform has been used for extreme rhetoric in the format of the Brexit referendum. It would be too much honor to say that this rhetoric played a decisive role, but it certainly did play a role. We are now confronted with the painful result of the British referendum vote. So it has been an honor to address this distinguished audience today on the subject of this great importance. Using some financial te terminology of which I'm certainly not an expert, I hope that this and similar discussions will help to contribute to raising the value of the trembling European stocks. That it would prevent the European Union from entering the bear market where it would be ripped apart by extreme populists. I hope you will all contribute to this process because I believe in the value of the common European project. Thank you. Thank you. It was very fruitful from my standpoint. But firstly, small note, I think that I found a case where the best interest of the child had been evaluated is this year's uh, case of uh, 26th of March. Probably you know it's about this Algerian kafala guardianship system. And by the way, the uh, court in this judgment linked the Article 7 of Charter uh, to this principle of the best interest of the child. Um, and my question to save the time uh, will be short as possible and as follows. Uh, how do you think, is this sui generis status of the EU necessarily leads to the legal positivism? Because I think that, uh, or maybe, uh, and I'm the supporter of this uh, theory, maybe we can, the ECJ should um, go back to roots, uh, so-called judicial positivism, activism, sorry, and, uh, you know, braver uh, implement principles of law, uh, you know, despite and in, with no regards to the legal norms necessarily. Um, and uh, this, on pendant to this question, maybe, the, the uh, ECJ could be the, you know, the main influencer of the sovereignty of the EU against these and other uh, power states like China and Russia, uh, like we discussed in the first part of the of the today's meeting. Thank you. Well, I I hope I I understood your question. If I did not, uh, please feel free to criticize me. Um, I haven't, uh, I saw that there was a kafala judgment because there was a, a very big debate uh, on the issue, uh, but I, I must admit I have not read that judgment careful enough. I'm not sure that uh, the, the analysis in that judgment of the best interest of the child is what I was looking for when I was speaking about the, uh, 
the various norms. But this was an interesting judgment because the court uh, was uh, confronted with the issue that uh, what effect should be given uh, to the principle that uh, come from a third state that is not even the state of the European Union because this is a principle of the Islamic law uh, that has to be applied by the European Union. The judicial activism of the Court of Justice is an extremely controversial issue because it comes again back to the interplay between the national sovereignty and the role of the Court of Justice. And I'm afraid that reply would have to be given and still has to be given on a case-by-case -case basis because if the court says yes, it provokes controversy. If the court says no, it provokes controversy. What I, what I would have to say that this is a challenge. And my view of that, that the court, what is important in this process, that the court is confronted with this issue as frequently as possible. Because the more case law the court gives, the better opportunity it gives us to draw some, some rules. Because for this moment, at, at this moment, for example, when I read the case law, I don't have a conclusive answer. We have sometimes the principle of autonomy, sometimes the principle of mutual trust, sometimes other principles, but still, I think the global picture maybe for good reasons, lacks um, clarity. But again, we have to go back to the fact that the Lisbon Treaty entered into force less than a decade ago. So we are in the process of evolving interpretation. And fundamental rights have not been binding. Yes, they have been part of the European common values before Lisbon. But Lisbon brought the values to the level of the treaties. And there is always interplay who has more role to say, the Commission or the Member States, and which Member States and under which conditions. So to come back to my very brief answer, the Court has to be confronted with, by this issue as often as possible. But this, again, uh, depends on the quality of, this, uh, of, the, of the preliminary question coming from the national jurisdictions. This is the cornerstone, the key element, because the court cannot, maybe with some exceptions um, that, uh, that have been there, the court cannot give an answer to the question that hasn't been asked. That is where the problem lies. Um, you mentioned that um, you personally would prefer the progressive interpretation of law and that maybe you're not completely at ease with the uh, Court of Justice's approach of uh, applying the uniform approach or the, the, um, uh, um, the, the ECJ standard approach. Uh, with a view to unity of EU law. And um, f I think from a human rights perspective, this seems quite a profound change that the Court of Justice has introduced because I think in classic human rights law and also in constitutional law, um, there are provisions which allow higher level of protection, which you mentioned as well, and Article 53 of the ECHR. <coughs> and many national constitutions also uh, spell out this principle that... Um, the higher level of protection can be provided regardless of whether this comes from the, the Constitution or from the treaties. And the Court of Justice, given that its, its rulings have a supremacy for all the member states, this seems quite a profound change, which I think hasn't received the attention that it deserves. So do you, how do you see the future development in this res respect? Um, well, as I said, I speak... As I said, in my personal capacity, I am a judge, so I do have my own limitations as, even if I'm not a judge of the Court of Justice, I'm a, the judge of a lower instance court. Um, but still I have limitations as to how much I and what I can say. But for me, um, the key principle, again, as I said, is the fact that questions should come. And I think the, the jurisprudence, the case law on the European arrest warrant showed that the more you ask, you bombard the European Court of Justice with the questions, and at some point of time, you find the path through the system. You find the triggering point. 
and maybe there is room to learn from, from those questions, uh, some of them have been extremely precisely uh, defined, to transpose them to other areas. Because this is issue, and I have been part of, I have taken part in a number of debates between the Court of Justice and members of national courts, because if you do not know, uh, maybe you know it very well, that once a year, the European Court uh, of Justice invites uh, members of national jurisdictions to a regular exchange of views. There is a very intensive uh, informal and formal dialogue between the jurisdictions to see how the process of preliminary reference could be improved, what are the pros and cons, which questions are, are being asked. So this is where the dialogue should continue. And I am afraid that this requires time. I'm, I agree with you that this issue, and I think everyone agrees, that this issue hasn't yet been fully addressed in the case law. But again, this has to be put against the background that the activism of the Court of Justice is limited. Everything evolves from the context of the preliminary reference proceedings. Which questions have a reason? Which questions the national judge has identified as uh, questions to be asked the European Court of Justice? There is no clear answer, but I think the future is ahead of us and we can learn from what we have. And maybe to come back to one of the points uh, of, of the previous questions, how do we, how the European Union should play against third member states such, such as China and Russia and others. This is also an extremely difficult issue in, in the case law because, um, well, mostly we, we look at this in the context of, uh, of dumping, anti-dumping cases. And there have been, uh, there have always been arguments against uh, the, the judgments that uh, the European Union is very protectionist of the system because the, 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 the case law clearly distinguishes between the WTO regime that is not being directly applicable in, in the context of the European Union law with some very, very limited exceptions. So judges are very concise of, of this very fragile um, yeah, division line. But I think so far the Court of Justice has found uh, the balance. And I think there has been an evolving case law also in dumping measures that international law principles exceptionally are directly applicable uh, and invocable uh, in the European Union context. But again, the case law needs to evolve. And again, for this, we need to have cases. Because sometimes I personally have a feeling that we go around the very known issues. We know there is one argument that the court has already examined, so we use that argument over and over and over and over again. And then we complain that the court has already given an answer and the court is not changing its position. Well, maybe the question needs to be changed for the court to change its position. See my point? If I may, just a, <clears throat> a comment rather than, than a question. I agree very much with your point that there are a number of issues concerning the Charter of Fundamental Rights that have not yet been addressed in the jurisprudence of the court. But my impression is that this is not something that is specific to, to the Charter. It is actually quite surprising, uh, 70 years down the line, the number of issues within the entire system of EU law that have not yet been drawn to the attention of, of the court. But as you correctly point out, that is mostly because of the fact that the court is driven by the questions that are submitted to it. And it's more that you can become statistically surprised by the fact that there are so many issues that nobody has yet found reason to question. I couldn't agree more with you. And I personally believe that we need to discuss what conclusion we may draw from the lack of this case law. Because again, if I put this against the background of the rule of law mechanism, how can we define common values if not all values, if the content of the values is not clear? And maybe that could be a subject of, uh, of another discussion because I haven't seen a lot uh, or maybe I didn't know where to look for, but I, hasn't, I haven't found an informative enough discussion of what does it mean, the absence of that case law. <laughs> 
why there is no case law.